This video includes three topics, 4.7 through 4.9, solar radiation and Earth seasons, Earth's geography and climate, and El Nino and La Nina. As we already know, it takes approximately 365 days for Earth to complete its annual trip around the Sun. As the planet and its inhabitants progress through this year-long journey, distinct regional climate patterns involving temperature and precipitation begin to emerge. These patterns are primarily connected to specific regions based on east-west lines of latitude. Reinforcing what we already observed in a previous video on Earth's patchwork of biomes, the distribution of organisms is influenced by these climate patterns. El Niño and La Niña are large-scale cyclical events in the Pacific Ocean that each cause very distinct weather phenomena over large regions of the globe. Earth's annual motion around the Sun is referred to as a revolution. 365 times a year, Earth completes a rotation on its axis. Relative to the imaginary plane of revolution around the Sun, Earth's axis is tilted 23.5 degrees. It is this axial tilt that results in the characteristic seasonal changes experienced by the northern and southern hemispheres outside of the tropics. Incoming solar radiation provides both light and warmth to Earth. It is the angle at which those incoming solar rays strike the Earth that influence how much light and warmth is received. In December, the sun's rays are closer to perpendicular over the southern hemisphere. Three months later, in March, the sun's rays are perpendicular to the equator. In June, the sun's rays are closer to perpendicular in the northern hemisphere, and then back to perpendicular over the equator again in September. Because equatorial regions receive the most consistent solar radiation, temperature and light availability are relatively uniform throughout the entire year. It is this stability and climate that makes possible greater biodiversity in the tropics. Traveling to regions north of the equator or south of the equator, greater seasonal variation in light and temperature is experienced farther away from the equator. Seasonal changes in the northern and southern hemisphere are offset from one another. When it's summer in one hemisphere, it's winter in the other. Let's consider those seasons and their start dates from our perspective in the northern hemisphere. In late December, the sun's apparent position in the sky at the start of winter is directly over a line of latitude called the Tropic of Capricorn, approximately 23 degrees south of the equator. Following the first day of winter, the sun's position in the sky each day moves apparently farther and farther north until it is directly over another line of latitude called the equator. This date in March represents the vernal equinox, the start of spring. As the days pass, moving closer to late June, the sun's position in the sky moves north of the equator until it reaches approximately 23 degrees north, the Tropic of Cancer, and marking the start of summer. In the three months that follow, the sun's apparent position now moves in a southward direction until it crosses the equator again on the autumnal equinox, indicating the beginning of fall. So, year after year, the sun's position in the sky appears to move in a zigzag pattern, moving north from December to June and south from June to December. Although latitude is the most significant variable in resulting climate patterns, geographic features such as mountain ranges and the size of continental masses also play a role in the seasonal changes that are typical for a region. Also, since the southern hemisphere has substantially more ocean than the northern hemisphere, and water has a very high capacity for absorbing heat, 
annual temperature variations tend to be less dramatic in the southern hemisphere, but more varied in the northern hemisphere. As we know from our study of the hydrologic cycle, precipitation is the mechanism by which water falls from the sky, sometimes in liquid form and sometimes solid. Precipitation falls pretty much everywhere on Earth, although much less frequently in arid deserts and much more consistently in the tropics. Large volumes of moving air that contain water vapor are referred to as atmospheric rivers. Evaporated water in one region of Earth are transported by these rivers to other regions where it falls as precipitation. In places where hills or mountains are more or less perpendicular to the flow of these atmospheric rivers, a phenomenon called a rain shadow results. It begins when an air mass containing water vapor moves onshore and encounters a physical barrier in the form of a large hill or mountain. The mountain forces the air mass to rise, which then cools, the water in it condenses and falls to the ground as precipitation. By the time the air mass makes it to the other side of the mountain, most of the water vapor that it contained has already precipitated out. The Puget Sound region provides a perfect example of a couple of these rain shadow effects. Moist air traveling on land from the Pacific Ocean is first obstructed by the Olympic Mountains. The west side of those mountains receive much more precipitation than the east side, which includes Seattle, Bellevue, and Issaquah. The Cascade Mountains produce another rain shadow effect, since eastern Washington receives much less precipitation than we do. El Nino and La Nina are opposite climatic phenomena that cycle in the Pacific Ocean every few years. In a neutral year, neither El Nino nor La Nina, surface winds over the Pacific Ocean push warmer water away from the Americas and toward the Western Pacific. But during an El Nino cycle, for reasons that are not yet well understood, the trade winds weaken, allowing the relatively warmer surface waters of the Pacific to move toward the Americas. La Nina is the exact opposite of El Nino. In a La Nina cycle, unusually strong trade winds drive warm surface waters away from the Americas even more strongly, resulting in significantly cooler water in the eastern Pacific. Let's take a look at a short video from the Smithsonian and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration that will help to illustrate these two phenomena. Warmer or colder than average ocean temperatures in one part of the world can influence weather around the globe. Boggles the mind, right? Here's how it works. During normal conditions, trade winds, which blow from east to west, push warm surface waters towards Asia, piling it up in the western Pacific. In some years, though, the trade winds weaken, the warm surface water moves eastward, and reduces upwelling of cold water off the coast of South America. Climatologists call this El Nino. Its climate impacts show up mostly in the wintertime over North America. The warmer ocean fuels an intensification and southward shift of the jet stream. This brings flooding to the southern United States and warmer, drier conditions over parts of the Pacific Northwest, northern U.S. and Canada. But eventually, those trade winds pick up again and sometimes become even stronger than normal. When that happens, they blow the warm water back into the western Pacific and restart the upwelling of cool water towards the surface in the eastern Pacific. These strong trade winds are a signature of what is called La Nina, unusually cold conditions in the tropical Pacific that displace the jet stream northward. La Nina can lead to drought in the southern U.S. and cooler temperatures, heavy rains, and flooding in the Pacific Northwest. El Nino and La Nina together are part of a cycle that influences extreme weather and can impact food production, water supply, and even human health, not just in the U.S., but in many parts of the globe.
Although these two cycles generally affect the Americas most substantially, their effects are global. The cycles influence both temperature and precipitation in East and Southeast Asia, Australia, and even as far away from the Pacific as Africa. That brings this presentation to an end. Thanks so much for watching. Take care.